As retro computers have continued to age, many have needed repairs. Some are simple and easy, and others, not so much. This matte color classic crossed my path with an obvious problem. Question is, will the fix be as straightforward? The Macintosh Color Classic has an interesting history. It launched in 1993, and while it didn't sell very well when new, it didn't take long to become a favorite among Mac enthusiasts. I've had a soft spot for these machines for a long time, so when I got the opportunity to pick up a broken one, I knew I needed to try figuring out what was wrong. It's in good shape cosmetically, with just a bit of yellowing and a few scuffs. It was also complete, and its motherboard had already had its capacitors replaced. Based on just how clean this board is, it looks like the original caps hadn't leaked much, if at all, prior to being removed, which was a very good sign. The problem with this machine was pretty straightforward, though. It would power on, but fail to boot. No startup chime or video. I like the troubleshooting philosophy of divide and conquer. Try to split the problem in half and see where the fault lies. In this case, my known good Color Classic would prove useful. I exchanged the motherboards between the machines and was glad to see that my good board worked just fine in the other chassis. So that eliminated any concerns about its analog board or power supply circuitry. The bad news is that it looks like the broken machine's motherboard was definitely the culprit, as it still failed to boot in the working system's chassis. Something a little different is that it produced a gray screen this time, which it didn't do in its own enclosure. But I know that the analog board in this one needs a recap, so it's quite possible that's a factor here. Time to take a closer look at the problematic motherboard to see if there's any apparent problems. It looked just as clean under the microscope as I'd anticipated, with no obvious signs of corroded traces or damaged pins on the chips. The new caps had also been installed well, and their polarity was correct, so I don't think they have anything to do with the board not working. I've never had to deal with a problematic color classic like this before, so I turned to the Tinker Different forums to solicit advice. I got a lot of helpful responses, one of which was to check the bottom of the board. Several spring terminals here make contact with the shielding inside the chassis to form a ground connection, and if they were missing, supposedly that could cause problems. But this board had all of them, and continuity between it and the shield looked good. Another common problem I was advised about relates to this chip at position U7. It's called the CUDA chip, and it controls many of the low-level functions of the system, including power on. Its proximity to a capacitor means that often leaking electrolyte can make its way underneath and wreak havoc. So I broke out the hot air station and carefully desoldered it. But it didn't really look that bad underneath. Only a few traces passed through this area, and the board cleaned up very well. I threw the chip in my cheap ultrasonic cleaner just to be sure, but with nothing obviously wrong, I got it soldered back into place. To my disappointment, the system still failed to boot, so I needed to keep looking. The next factor I had to consider were the capacitors. Yes, they were new and installed correctly, but they were still a variable that could be causing this board's problems. So I made the decision to remove them and ensure that there wasn't any lingering corrosion or inadvertent shorts. There definitely didn't appear to be as the solder pads looked perfect. I installed new electrolytic caps just in case one or more of the previous ones were bad. This was unlikely, of course, and I wish I could have put new tantalums in, but electrolytics were all I had on hand. I wasn't expecting this to have any difference, and sure enough, it didn't. But at least it's another troubleshooting step I could cross off the list. 
Short of desoldering every chip on the board to check for corrosion, I opted next to give the whole thing a soak for a few hours in isopropyl alcohol. It would be best if I had an ultrasonic cleaner for this, but like a lot of other retro computing enthusiasts, I don't have one big enough nor a place to store it. In fact, none of the tools I've used have been all that exceptional or overly expensive. Perhaps a good representation of what the average hobbyist might have available, though it could limit my chances of actually fixing the problem. After letting the board dry for a day, I gave it another shot. Of course it didn't work, so on to other things to check. Another chip on the Color Classics motherboard to look into is at location U5 and called DFAC. It's part of the system's sound circuitry, but has also been known to cause startup issues. So the hot air came out again, and thankfully the foil shielding I applied kept any of the adjacent connectors or components from getting damaged. And like with the CUDA chip earlier, the PCB looked just fine under here too. This board really was in good shape, and it was becoming clear that looking for corrosion was a wild goose chase. Component failure was much more likely at this point, so I got the defect chip cleaned up and soldered back down. This was a bit trickier since it's a PLCC package, but having the microscope was a big help. Though it was also a bit of a hindrance in that I was focusing so much on the legs of the chip, I totally missed the fact that I had accidentally melted the PDS connector a little. Whoops. No surprise that the machine still didn't boot, so I moved on to one last bit of troubleshooting. Both the DFAC and CUDA chips have pins that can reset them, and I was wondering if maybe they were somehow being held in that state. It's tough to probe anything on this board while it's in the chassis, so I soldered a couple wires to the relevant pins, then taped them down and slid the board back in. With the Color Classic running, I was getting about 5 volts from the CUDA chip, as well as the DFAC. That's normal for both, so it's yet another thing that isn't wrong with this machine. I poured through the board schematics and probed out the traces from both chips, but couldn't find anything wrong. One last attempt was to swap the ROM chips between my good Color Classic and this one. I wasn't willing to use my good machine as a parts donor, but since these chips were socketed, it was relatively low risk to exchange them. And you guessed it, that didn't make a difference either. It had become quite obvious that I was stuck. The next logical step would be to start swapping components, but therein lies the problem. Several chips, including CUDA and DFAC, were custom and never sold through normal suppliers. Even places that specialize in these kinds of components had no stock left. The only way I could get replacements would be to scavenge them off of another board. But that leads to a catch-22 in that many other dead boards likely failed from the same problem, so their chips wouldn't be suitable as replacements. Only in the situation where something like a clock or PRAM battery leak could yield a usable donor board. But the Color Classic was a pretty uncommon machine when new, so motherboards in that condition aren't going to come up very often. And with others experiencing the same problem as mine, there's a surprising amount of demand for these. Thankfully, some headway is being made to replace these obsolete or custom chips. For example, the resistor packs that some other Mac models use have been discontinued, so the hobbyist community has managed to replicate them and make all the details open source. Granted, a resistor pack is a far simpler circuit than a custom chip, but there's hope that someday these other ICs can be reverse engineered and reproductions made available. For now though, this Mac has gotten the best of me. An obvious alternative would be to simply ditch the stock board and swap in one from an LC575, something known as the Mystic Mod. This would have the added benefit of speeding up the machine dramatically since it would replace the original 16 MHz 68030 CPU with a 33 MHz 68 LC040. But that's become such a popular option, 575 boards sell for hundreds of dollars, as much as complete stock Color Classic systems. And while I own an LC575, 
I'm not willing to sacrifice it for this project. Perhaps in time I'll stumble across some further troubleshooting that I can do, or maybe I'll get lucky and have a donor board drop into my lap. And that's one of the most frustrating parts of retro computing. As much as we now understand about these old systems, parts availability is becoming the biggest roadblock. But there's a good chance that someday I'll be able to get this one up and running again. It's just going to take a bit of patience.